Hello, I'm Kimberly Acosta. Welcome to the Native News Update. It's Wednesday, June 22nd, and many of the stories you hear here can be found at IndianCountryNews.com. And here's the news for the day from the Associated Press and other Native News sources. Big cigarette makers could recoup $2 billion under a proposed deal with state attorneys general to resolve a long-running dispute over payments required by the landmark 1998 tobacco settlement. Negotiators for Philip Morris USA and other big, com big tobacco companies have reached a tentative deal with officials representing the 46 states that signed the 1998 Master Settlement Agreement. The accord would allow big tobacco companies to keep part of the money they have withheld from states or otherwise disputed under the 1998 pact, under which they agreed to pay more than $200 billion to help states recover the cost of treating sick smokers. States and the companies have battled over $7.1 billion that the companies argue they shouldn't have to pay on the sales from 2003 through 2010. The dispute resolves around the company's contention that they have lost business because states haven't adequate, adequately sought payments from smaller competitors not party to the 1998 pact. If it goes through, the big, biggest losers could be Native American cigarette companies. The deal would require states to adopt rules forcing these companies to start paying state excise taxes and fees for sales on tribal lands, which could force them to boost their prices. Lawyers representing Indian cigarettes' interests are expecting legal challenges to mount. What the state and companies are doing is wrong by any sort of definition of fair play, said Lance Morgan, chief executive of Ho-Chunk, Inc., the economic development arm of the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, which distributes cigarettes on tribal lands. He argues the states under the deal would be attacking tribal economies to protect big companies' market shares. Morgan Stanley analysis David Edelman estimates Native American brands, which include such names as Seneca, King Mountain, and Mohawk, may account for as much as 4% of U.S. cigarette volumes. New York State can move forward with collecting taxes on cigarettes sold by Indian tribes to non-tribal members now that the appellate division of the state Supreme Court has lifted a preliminary injunction. In a decision handed down June 21st, the court denied a motion by the Seneca Nation to extend a ban on the collection of taxes until a legal challenge against the state is decided. In making its ruling, the legal panel upheld a lower court ruling that said New York State followed state procedural requirements in adopting regulations spelling out how the taxes would be collected and how the undisputed tax exemption on Indian sales to tribal members would be preserved. The Seneca Nation is not giving up its fight and will ask for a review of the most recent court decision. In part, President Robert Odawi Porter said the New York will never collect a cent of revenue from tobacco sales occurring in our territories, and revenue projections so indicating are foolishness. He added, instead, today marks the beginning of a new era in the nation's tobacco trade and exercise of our sovereignty. He vowed to continue to block the state's efforts, explaining that while the state may be able to embargo through taxation premium brands for entering our territory, it cannot tax the brands made in our territory or any of the Six Nations. After playing in the AT&T National next week, Tiger Woods was planning on helping out college roommate Nota Begay III by competing in his annual charity event to benefit Native American youth. With an announcement that Woods, the main draw for the event, will not be able to compete th that week on the PGA Tour, the charity event has been postponed. The event scheduled for July 5th at the Turning Stone Resorts Golf Course will be rescheduled for a later date, likely when Woods can compete. The event has been very successful toward its cause, raising nearly $2.5 million for programs geared at Native American youth. Young men of color, regardless of cultural background, face educational barriers that cause them to be less educated than minority women and white men. According to a press release, two new reports released by the College Board Advocacy and Policy Center highlighted the educational issues that African American, Asian American, Pacific Islander, Hispanic Latino, and Native American men face. Data showed that just 18% of Hispanic Americans have at least an associate's degree, 24% of Native Americans and Pacific Islanders, and 26% of African Americans hold at least a two-year degree. As the Chronicle of Higher Education pointed out, men of all cultural backgrounds reported experiencing similar challenges such as stereotypes, 
pressure to support their communities or families, money problems, or feelings of alienation from their campus. The most shocking statistics that researchers found was that more than 50% of young men of color died, were incarcerated, or were unemployed before the age of 24. Officials say Bones found June 20, excuse me, officials say Bones found June 16th at the Oak Ar Harbor construction site in Seattle, Washington are from Native Americans who have died more than 400 years ago. Allison Brooks with the Washington State Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation said that the bones are at least from three people. The construction project is on hold while the state and city consult with tribes to determine if the location was a burial site. A state anthropologist, Guy Tessa, said last week there is a chance that the bones were buried there before the 1700s. Some museum artifacts being stored at the Ocean Crest Resort restaurant in Mocklips, Washington may have been damaged in an early morning fire this, earlier this month. Tim Dunn with the Museum of the North Beach in Mocklips tells KBKW some items were stored at the restaurant while the museum is being re renovated. The museum exhibits some quant Quinault baskets and items from early settlers in the Washington coast. The extent of the damage is yet not known. North Dakota Tax Commissioner Corey Fong has announced that June 30th is the last day eligible consumers may apply for a refund of the state fuel taxes they paid on gasoline or gasohol purchased during 2010. The refund is available to farmers, ranchers, industrial contractors, emergency medical service operations, and certain Native Americans. Native American consumers who are enrolled members of the Turtle Mountain Band of Chippewa may request a refund of 23 cents per gallon for gasoline or non-dye diesel purchased on their reservation through August of 2010. Purchases by members of the three, affiliate, three affiliated tribes, Standing Rock Sioux, and Spirit Lake tribes are not eligible because the tax they pay goes directly to the tribe. For more information on the motor fuel tax refund, visit the tax department's website at www.nd.gov forward slash tax. Utah Governor Gary Herbert named Shirley Silversmith as the new director of the Division of Indian Affairs within the Utah Department of Community and Culture. Silversmith's appointment was the outcome of a thorough process of reviewing candidates with the lieutenant governor and several tribal representatives. Governor Herbert included tribal representatives from across the state to assist in the screening and interview process. Born and raised on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in central eastern Arizona, Silversmith is an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation. She received a Bachelor of Science in Secondary Education from Brigham Young University and a Master's in Education from the U Arizona State University. For the past four years, Silversmith has worked at the, as the Learning for Life Director an affiliate of the Boy Scouts of America at the Utah National Parks Council. Previously, she worked with the Utah State Office of Education as the Indian Education Specialist for nearly 20 years. Plans for an elder housing complex on the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation are going green. The Eastern Oregonian reports the Umatilla Housing Authority is considering sustainability and energy efficiency in its plan for the 27,000 square foot complex. The complex will have 22 apartments with a community elder center on the ground floor. Some of the sustainability plans include using refrigeration lines to transfer warm air between rooms instead of using air conditioning. The University of Tennessee at Knoxville held a ribbon cutting ceremony for the Native American Mound Gardens situated on the university's agricultural campus on June 15th. The focus of the garden is a 1400 year old woodland Indian burial mound. The agricultural campus has grown up around the burial mound, though the mound has been threatened by construction several times in the past. In the early 1980s, staff members created a small pedestrian park around the mound with the idea that it would not only create a quiet, reflective setting for students, but that it would also help protect the mound area from construction damage. Over the past year, university leaders planned a much more ambitious project for the area around the mound that would not only protect it, but would also serve to educate visitors about the Cherokee and their ancestors that built the mound. Improvements to the mound garden include enhanced walking paths, built-in seating, native plantings, and interpretive signage detailing aspects of the Cherokee history and, cult and culture associated with the region. 
And that's the latest roundup of news from Indian Country on this edition of the Native News Update. I'd like to thank you for joining me and have a grand day.